This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Hello, everyone. First sound check. How do I sound? In the back. OK, good. It's a pleasure to be back at IHMC. Uh, let me start by telling you what I do in less of a formal bio sense. A main goal of my career is to translate complex ideas into ideas that are more easily graspable so that more people can benefit from them. Sometimes the complexity of an idea gets uh, veiled behind uh, the language. And so it's an important part of what I do. My last talk was at the Pensacola location back in November 2022. And that talk was titled Actual Health, How to Stay Human in the Digital Age. You can find that talk by searching IHMC and Dan Party on YouTube. The title of my talk today is Measuring Health. What should we measure? Since this talk is about how to measure health, we need to have a good understanding of what health is. What is it that we are trying to measure? While I began my last talk exploring this same question, what is health, I will start this talk by investigating the topic with some more depth. If you saw the last talk, you might recall that I started by discussing lexical semantics, which is the branch of lingu linguistics concerned with word meaning. Some ideas are easier to encircle with semantic meaning, while other concepts are more challenging. Concepts so rich, so expansive, that they seem ineffable. For these types of concepts, definitional offerings can be so broad that they hardly mean anything at all. They have no teeth. More precise offerings, on the other hand, are easily criticizable, as we try to squeeze a large concept into a box that is ultimately too small. Or they suffer from tautology, where we define the word by using the word. Thus, in scenarios like this, you get semantic uncertainty, where different ex explanations of its meaning cause confusion. And yet, to quote Socrates, the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. We don't, if we don't have a solid definition for something, several undesirable outcomes are possible. First, division between camps with competing ideas. Next, inefficiencies in operationalizing around that concept. And third, marginalization of key parts if other parts dominate the majority perspective and the dialogue. Additionally, attempts to measure health may be biased towards only portions of health that fall under the lens of the proverbial microscope. It reminds me of the parable of the man who lost his keys. The parable goes as follows. A man is walking home one night and realizes he lost his keys. He starts to search for them under the street lamp because that is where the light is even though he knows, he knows that he lost them elsewhere. A passerby sees him searching and asks him where he lost his keys. The man points to a dark alley and says that he lost them down there. But he's searching under the street lamp because it's too dark in that alley to see anything. The moral of the story is that people often focus on what is easily accessible, even if it may not be most effective or efficient approach to solve a problem. Similarly, if we are like, um, it's entirely likely that our society has constrained the, our understanding of health by virtue of what we can and can't measure. So keep this in mind as we enter into this discussion on measurement. To better understand health, I'd like to introduce philosopher Christopher Bohr's. Bohr's has made significant contributions to the philosophy of medicine. He is famous for his biostatistical theory of health and disease. According to his theory, health is the absence of any statistically abnormal functioning of an organism's physiological systems. A healthy individual, therefore, is one whose physiological functioning falls within a range of what is considered statistically normal for their age, sex, race, and other relevant factors. What about disease? According to Bohr's, disease is the opposite of health. It is the presence of any statistically abnormal functioning of an organism's physiological systems. A disease is simply not in the nature of a species. 
It is anything that prevents a body part from functioning normally or interferes with the performance of some natural function, thus decreasing chances for survival and reproduction. For instance, a cataract is an eye disease that causes blurry or hazy vision. It negatively impacts functioning of this physiological system and is therefore a disease. So diseases are internal states that depress a functional ability below a species typical level. What is illness? Is there a difference between illness and disease? There is not a clear difference between these terms. In fact, in the literature or in the parlance of those discussing illness and, and disease, there is considerable overlap between these terms and what, uh, what they are used to describe. Christopher Bohr describes illness as a systemic disease affecting the organism as a whole. Some use illness to mean an issue that is reversible, while a disease really isn't. And yet other, in other instances, illness is used when a condition exacts a subjective negative toll, causing suffering in the individual. In contrast, some diseases may not be noticeable at all. So an illness affects the whole person and has a significant impact on a person's quality of life, ability to function, and overall well-being. Speaking of well-being, it is another term often discussed with health or used as a synonym. In fact, in 1948, the World Health Organization defined health as not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, but a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So according to them, health is a state of complete well-being. And the World Health Organization defines well-being as a state of being in good health, both physically and mentally. So health is a state of being complete well-being, and well-being is a state of being in good health, both physically and mentally. The World Health Organization also characterizes well-being as a person's ability to cope with and overcome the challenges of everyday life. Now, there are two types of well-being that are often discussed. Hedonic well-being refers to the cognitive evaluation of life's satisfaction and a positive affect. Eudaimonic well-being is related to the determination of life's meaning and self-actualization. I don't see health and well-being as synonyms. I see them as distinct but intimately linked. Let's look at how these two concepts interact. Let's look at an aspect of health or mental health. Mental health is the condition of the mind. And like any form of health, mental health is a dynamic state of internal equilibrium. A good mental, good mental health enables an individual to use their abilities in harmony with the universal values of society. Aside from just the absence of illness, mental health also includes things like basic cognitive and social skills, the ability to recognize, express, and modulate emotions, the ability to empathize with others, cope with adverse life events, and function in social roles. Some researchers have argued that mental health also includes the capacity to value life and also the capacity to engage in it. But does this feel right to you, where we have mental illness on one end of the spectrum and happiness and well-being on the other end? We know that we can have a happy psychopath who has tendencies to live life aberrant to the rules of society. On the other hand, there are circumstances in which one's mind will instantiate the properties needed for mental health, but in which one's pursuit of well-being is frustrated by the wider world. That is, they are unhappy, let's say, because they lost their job or having to take care of a sick relative. So, what we are really dealing with is two different scales, where mental health is the condition of the mind, and well-being is a matter of how a person feels about their life. So health and well-being are different things. But these two things interact and affect one another. For instance, if you take someone with attention deficit disorder, the condition of their mind has a hard time performing the needed capability of focusing, and you can easily imagine how this would be a significant drain on happiness as this affected individual struggles to do their tasks efficiently in a modern environment with modern pressures. And how that situation could very likely affect this person, how this person feels about aspects of their life. 
and vice versa. Mental health is not in fact likely to endure under circumstances that are seriously detrimental to well-being. It is easy to imagine a person developing depression after years of taking care of a dying loved one. But we can clearly see from these examples and illustrations that health and well-being are not the same thing, but important travel partners. Welfare is another term of interest for our purpose of understanding health. It is used synonymously with well-being, just like illness and disease are used synonymously. I prefer to create a clear distinction between well-being and welfare so that we can use each of them pointedly. While well-being is about life satisfaction, positive affect, life meaning, and self-actualization, welfare refers to the environmental conditions in which health of an individual or group is occurring. Welfare can include access to resources such as health care, education, housing, employment, social support, and protection from harm, all of which directly or indirectly impact physiological and mental health. Importantly, while another person cannot be healthy for you or have well-being for you, people can look after the well-being of some, the welfare, excuse me, of someone else, like a parent looking after the welfare of a child, or even, pers even a person taking care of a houseplant and making sure it has good soil, the right amount of light and water to survive and thrive. That person is looking after the welfare of that plant to ensure it is in good health. Here is an illustration of the idea of welfare in action. Let's say there is an environmental catastrophe at an oil refinery in a small town. The catastrophe poisons the water supply, eliminates most of the local jobs, and half of the town's people move somewhere else. This illustration depicts radical change in the living circumstances for these townspeople. The physical environment has increased in toxicity in the air, water, and soil. There are now fewer job opportunities, which affect one's ability to attain health-related resources, like food, healthy food. And their social community has changed. It has shrank, and many of its re remaining inhabitants are now psychologically stressed, which has a contagious quality to it the stress of others as a stress-inducing factor for the entire community. Therefore, the welfare of these people have been significantly altered. You would predict with great certainty that the average health of these people in this town would diminish measurably in time. Lastly, let's look at wellness. According to the Global Wellness Institute, wellness is about making choices aimed towards optimizing holistic health and well-being. It is not a passive or static state, but an active individual pursuit that is associated with intentions, choices, and actions. While not all humans share an equitable baseline from which our wellness efforts begin, we still have self-responsibility for our behaviors and lifestyles. For instance, a man in jail may not have full freedom to determine the pattern of their life, but uh, even with these restrictions, he can decide to perform or not perform push-ups in a cell in order to improve and maintain his own health. Let's do a synthesis here. We have talked about health as physiological functioning and whether the measure of that functioning falls in statistical normal ranges for the species sex, race, and age. If there is a dysfunction, is that dysfunction system-wide? preventable or reversible, or permanent or reversible, excuse me, or causing discomfort or suffering. The answer to which would help determine if this is a disease or an illness. We've talked about well-being, or how a person feels their life is going, and how personal circumstances and mind frame impact one's health, and how a person's health level affects their well-being. We discussed a, personal, a person's environment and social circumstances and how those support well-being and health. Welfare can be thought of as the condition in which one's health is taking place. And lastly, wellness. The willful efforts one makes to improve and support their health. All of these topics are really discussing health from different perspectives or through different lenses. Kind of how like jogging and sprinting are really talking about running but just, using different, but just in different forms of it. So with this foundational understanding of health in mind, 
let's begin our discussion on measurement. Why do we measure in the first place? To understand our health status, to find insights on things that might otherwise be hard to perceive. For instance, we cannot feel heart disease or cancer developing often. And to help your healthcare team, including you, make more informed decisions about your health practice and your health care. And for some, curiosity, the desire to simply learn and know more about your body, even if you were not inquiring about something specific. Measurement is big business. It is difficult to provide an exact number of health measurement tests that exist. New tests are constantly being developed and existing tests are updated or replaced. But there are thousands of health tests currently available. In fact, the global biomarker market is estimated to be $59.1 billion in 2023, and it is projected to grow 12% year over year to a market size of over $104 billion in 2028. So the biomarker business is big. What exactly is a biomarker? Simply put, a biomarker is any characteristic of the body that can be measured. A biomarker test that is used to identify the presence or absence of a disease or condition, more specifically, is a diagnostic. So not all biomarker tests are considered diagnostics. And there are many levels to humans that we can attempt to measure. Molecules, cells, tissue, organs and organ systems, the whole organism, and its performance. We can measure excretions of the body, things like urine, feces, sweat, saliva, and breath. We can measure things in the blood, hormones, metabolites, proteins, lipids, sugars, anthropometry, weight, height, waist circumference, bone density, adiposity. We can do imaging on the body. We can test a person's senses. We can do different types of functional tests like lung function tests or cardiovascular function tests, muscular strength, psychomotor vigilance tests or reaction time, tests of memory, et cetera, et cetera. Or others like temperature, blood pressure. We can take a hair sample and analyze it many different ways. We can look at skin elasticity. We can do a biopsy. Or we can do questionnaires. How do you feel? What are your opinions about this? What are your attitudes towards this idea? What's your perspective on this? Do you remember your recall? And then this isn't really a what to measure, but kind of how we measure. There are omics, which is big data processing on very complex systems in the body, like our genome or our microbiome. If you, call, if you recall Christopher Bohr's definition for health and disease, health is the absence of any statistically abnormal functioning of an organism's physiological systems for their age, sex, race, and other relevant factors. And disease is the opposite. It's the presence of statistically abnormal functioning. Therefore, for each individual thing we would like to use to measure health in some way, we must first establish normative values so that we can make sense of the information that we gather. That is not an easy task. Yet doing so is a valuable endeavor. But normality itself is a challenging concept, especially when physiological norms and societal norms are considered at the same time. We can use an example of smokers to illustrate what I mean. If everybody smoked, it would be sociologically normal to smoke in the sense of being common. Given that risk calculations look at deviations outside the normal range, the behavior of smoking would not be considered risky. Despite this sociological calculation, smoking would remain physiologically abnormal and therefore risky when calculated in a non-smoking population. Additionally, deciding on what is normal may become increasingly problematic if normal ranges are calibrated against an increasingly sick population, like we are seeing in many modern societies. This is one of the reasons why we are so interested to measure health in natural, natural living modern-day hunter-gatherer societies like the Chimane of Bolivia and the Hadza of Tanzania. In some ways, measurements of these people may represent truer values of human health than ones calibrated against already modernized humans. Now, when assessing risk, we create ranges. 
and a figure tucked just inside the normal range, but only one point away from a disease category, has the same calculated risk as a figure that is farther from the diagnostic cutoff. And so while this calculation might be statistically true, it might not be clinically true that these two individuals have the same risk for an outcome. I mentioned this as preamble to ask, how do we determine optimal? It's possible, we just haven't prioritized that historically when we were mostly concerned with determining frank borders for the purposes of making a, di a disease diagnosis so that our me medical system could treat it. But what, would, what you'd imagine an optimal range to be is a narrower range within the normative range that statistically would show to differentiate on certain outcomes between the rest of the values in the norm normative range. Now, an adult can assess their data against ranges and figures in various ways. We can look at ranges established in healthy people in their demographic community, age, sex, uh, age, sex and race, or even against their own personal historical figures. This is, this type of comparison can be used to calculate an adult's youth span or the preservation of functions from categorical or personal peak values. This idea is exploited by the company QBio who does a comprehensive screen of all body systems and repeats those scans every so often to create a longitudinal record of your biomarkers over time. Because everyone is unique, they feel that a within-person comparison is the best way to measure one's, uh, oneself. Lastly, novelty challenges standard refer reference ranges. If one adopts, let's say, a novel diet, and in response, a biomarker is elevated but stable, does that elevated value indicate risk in the same way it does in the reference class that risk was originally based? Does, for instance, a higher LDL value carry the same risk in the context of a ketogenic diet than it does in a typical Western diet? Does this value have the same meaning? Maybe yes, maybe no. But when faced with a situation like this, it seems prudent to me to assume that an aberrant score does imply elevated risk until proven otherwise. But you will often see advocates of a new position use a form of sleight of hand, saying that an aberrant score is not risky because of X, Y, and Z. That might be true, we just need time to work it out. And we don't want to make casual assumptions when it comes to people's health. So, we rarely measure disease directly. Rather, we collect biomarkers and see what ranges they fall into so that we can attempt to predict the future. Most often, this is a multi-step approach. In clinical medicine, our healthcare system cannot afford to give everyone the most thorough, most expensive test as a screening tool. Additionally, more thorough tests are often come with additional risk to the patient as they can be more invasive. Therefore, for both cost and safety, a quicker and dirtier measurement happens first. And if that test indicates a possible issue, this now merits the use of a more expensive, riskier test, which will hopefully give you a clearer picture of the situation. But mainly, we use biomarker values to try to predict the future. How does this happen? There are a variety of approaches, but one of the most common is that scientists will conduct experiments, controlling variables, and measuring specific parameters. From there, math, uh, mathematical and statistical models are used to extrapolate trends and patterns observed in the data to then draw associations to specific outcomes. And now, with techniques such as machine learning and bioinformatics, scientists have been able to increase the predictive value of biomarkers to better identify disease outcomes, drug responses, and other biological phenomenon. It's important to note that predicting future outcomes in health is a dynamic process. It, it involves constant refinement and ongoing validation as new information emerges and as new techniques to evaluate data emerge. Let me give you an example. Recently, I had a conversation with Professor Pankaj Kapahi from the Buck Institute on Aging for my podcast, Human OS Radio. He and a team from Google Health and UCSF recently published a paper on a biological age clock that is measured through the human eye. I will discuss biological age clocks more in the next section. But the point I'd like to make now is that they used deep learning AI models on hundreds of thousands of eye records for, from various databases. And the AI model was able to predict outcomes that weren't possible before 
including measurements of biological age. And one of the most interesting parts about the conversation with Professor Kapahi was when he mentioned that they didn't know how the AI was making its predictions. That is one of the crazy parts about AI. At times, we can train it to do a job even better than the best human experts, but we don't often know how it is doing what it is doing. But the promise here is that we can feed future AI models mountains of data from populations, and then all of your own personal health data, and perhaps it'll be able to make some insightful predictions that were impossible to make previously. In regard to testing, accuracy and precision are two fundamental concepts used to assess the performance of a health biomarker. An accurate biomarker provides results that are in close agreement with the actual value. In other words, it assesses the degree of correctness or trueness of the measurement. Accuracy is typically evaluated by comparing the biomarker measurements to a gold standard or reference method if that is available. Precision measures the reproducibility of repeated measures of that same biomarker under identical conditions. A precise biomarker produces consistent results when measured repeatedly. It is worth noting that a biomarker can be accurate but imprecise, producing results that are consistently far away from true values, or precise but inaccurate producing consistent measurements that are consistently biased away from a true value. Therefore, in order to have a reliable biomarker, it is essential to see adequate accuracy and precision when assessing its performance. A reliable biomarker is a trustworthy biomarker. I'd like to return to this idea about precision. Now, identical conditions doesn't just mean the lab in which it was tested, but also means things like time of day. For any test, I like to see two additional tests done in the process of validation. First, a 24-hour assessment, meaning that you would assess the biomarker approximately every hour or so across a 24-hour period. Does the variable in question naturally fluctuate across the day? Second, does the variable in question naturally fluctuate from day to day? In both of these cases, a change between measurement one and two might be interpreted as a clinically meaningful delta, when really the difference just reflects the natural and healthful variation of the marker in question. If there is natural fluctuation in a variable across a day, then the testing instructions should ensure that a test is taken at the same time every time it is administered for that individual. Now, what to do if there is natural variability from day to day? It would be ideal to collect daily data for a period, then look at the variability under, the, under normal circumstances of living. That is not always done in the validation of a test. And it's one of the reasons why periodic measurement of certain biomarkers are hard to interpret or have a wide standard deviation range. For these types of situations, you might only be confident that there is an issue worth investigating if the score on the second measure is vastly different than the score on the first measure. So the process of connecting a biomarker to an outcome is part of the biomarker's validation process. The goal of a diagnostic is to determine whether the biomarker can actually distinguish between affected and unaffected individuals. A biomarker has predictive value when it can reliably distinguish outcomes of people with different scores. And part of being reliable means that the performance of a biomarker must, adequately, must be adequate uh, for accuracy and precision. It's further useful when we know the natural within day and day-to-day -day variability of the marker in question so that we can make sense of the return values. Now, if a biomarker has enough supporting evidence behind it, it may receive regulatory approval from government, governing bodies like the FDA, allowing it to be used as a diagnostic tool for patient management and standards of care. Lastly, there's also adoption in the form of clinical adoption. Do doctors use it in their practice? Research adoption. Do scientists use it in their studies? And commercial adoption. Do people buy it if they can buy it directly without a doctor's prescription? But I must say that the commercial adoption is often predicated mostly on marketing, and that can be problematic. So, 
with these important foundational measurement concepts behind us, let's move on to part three on actual measurements. The most traditional use of biomarkers is for diagnostic purposes. And of course, this style of use makes great sense. We want to identify possible existential risk. According to the World Health Organization, the top 10 leading causes of death globally in 2020 were ischemic heart disease, stroke, COPD, lower respiratory infections, Alzheimer's disease, and other dementias, lung issues, diabetes mellitus, kidney disease, liver disease, and digestive diseases. In part two of this talk, we discussed how most diagnostics follow a screen first, deeply investigate second methodology, and how that makes sense from the perspective of cost, patient risk, and time. For each of the various killers, different tests can be done in various systems of the body, and for our time purposes, we will highlight only two, cardiovascular health and liver health. What are some common medical labs to evaluate the health and functioning of the cardiovascular system? Screening can include a lipid panel, cardiac enzyme test, PT, NT Pro, BPN tests, or natriuretic peptide tests, which measure the levels of a protein that can indicate heart failure, an electrolyte panel, complete blood count or CBC, coagulation panel, and erythrocy erythrocyte sedimentation rate or ESR, which measures the rate at which red blood cells settle in a test tube, which can indicate inflammation in the body. If there's an issue detected in the screening, a second evalu secondary evaluation can include electrocardiograms, echocardiograms, cardiac stress tests, cardiac ca catheterization, CT angiographies, and others. Now, to monitor liver health, liver function tests are a group of blood tests that evaluate aspects of liver health. They measure enzymes and proteins produced by the liver, such as ALT, AST, ALP, total bilirubin, GGT, PT. I bet all of us have had, if not all of these tests, most of them done. If there are signs of issues from the screen, a secondary evaluation may include imaging tests that check for liver damage and disease, as well as the size and texture of the liver. And these can include ultrasounds, CT scans, MRI, or even a biopsy to check the histology of the liver. So you get the idea. These diagnostic strategies are looking at specific organ systems in a two-step fashion dependent on need. But is there a way to assess health of the whole person? Well, the holy grail in measurement has been the idea that we could identify a single measurement of a person's health. The idea of a, biolo a biological age has served this role. It wasn't until the mid-1970s that the term biological age was coined by scientist Thomas Kirkwood. He defined it as the age of an organism as estimated from its physiological or biochemical state. Simply put, a biological age refers to the amount one has aged in the years they have lived. Some people age more slowly and some people age faster. Here is a graphical represent representation of the idea. We see an image of a man and a woman representing the average age of a cohort. On the left, we have the slowest aging members of the cohort. On the right, we have the 10 fastest aging cohort members. While you can see clear differences between each grouping, the differences are quite stark when comparing the slowest and fastest aging samples. Now, no, these people were born on the same day. An accurate measure of biological age should be valuable. It could serve as an indicator of overall health, provide insights into an individual's risk for age-related diseases, would provide an accurate signal of one's mortality and longevity probability, and would enable cost-effective quantification of any potential rejuvenation therapy. This could serve as a replacement for time-consuming and expensive lifespan studies. You see, humans' long lifespan makes it prohibitively time-consuming to test whether a treatment extends health span or lifespan. What we need is a way to measure each clinical trial participant's personal pace of aging before, during, and after a study, and in long-term follow-up to test the geroprotective therapy slows that pace and whether the benefits fade out. Having this could enable us to make much faster progress in determining 
where to place our focus and efforts when it comes to affecting the aging process. Biological age can be estimated using various biomarkers to provide information on an individual's cellular and molecular health, which can be used to calculate and estimate a person's biological age. There are actually many science-based tests and biomarkers that have been proposed as potential clocks for estimating someone's biological age. These in include telomere length tests, facial scans, test of one's microbiome, and as I mentioned previously with Professor Pankaj Kapahi from the Buck Institute on Aging, now there's even a retinal clock called IH. But the clocks, have, the clocks that have received the most attention in the last 10 years are epigenetic clocks. Let's take a look at those now. Epigenetics is the study of how our genes can be activated or silenced in response to the environment, including from diet, stress, environmental temperature, sun exposure, toxins, and more. Epigenetic changes can be passed down from one generation to the next and have a significant impact on our health and well-being. DNA methylation is a form of epigenetic regulation and a person's DNA methylation status changes as we age and as we are exposed to various environmental factors. So by understanding epigenetics, we can gain insight into how our lifestyle choices can affect our genes expression patterns and how we are aging. Launched in the early 2010s, we saw the first generation of epigenetic clocks. The Hanum clock, named after research, researcher Gregory Hanum from UC San Diego, analyzed 71 CPG sites, which are epigenetic marks, from DNA obtained from blood. And the Horvath clock, named after researcher Steve Horvath from UCLA, considered 353 CPG sites from mul uh, multiple tissues. Both the clocks managed to accurately predict a person's chronological age with high accuracy. Funny enough, the Hanum biological clock was discovered serendipitously. In a lab discussion, Greg Hanum said, guys, I just can't find any cancer signal uh, when analyzing my epigenome data. You know why? Because a person's, um, a person's age is such a pesky covariant. So many of the methylation marks just track age, and I can't get rid of that signal. The lab group all paused and said, you know, that's actually pretty interesting. So this is how they discovered that age could be predicted by looking at the marks on the epigenome. But these clocks correlated strongly with chronological age, but weakly with biological age and clinical measures of aging disease, such as high blood pressure. In 2018, scientists started to develop what we call second and third generation epigenetic tests. These were meant to improve morbidity and mortality prediction. The newer generation epigenetic clocks were, are good, at, uh, at good health predictors, or at least as good as any standard lab tests currently used in clinical settings like LDL, um, creatinine, etc. Second generation clocks have been trained on other age-related measures, including a phenotypic biomarker of morbidity, or phenoage, and a time to all cause mortality, or grim age. This test was developed by DNA, this is a test that I just mentioned, uh, this is phenoage, this was developed by Morgan Levine and her team at Yale. It is uh, based on DNA, DNA methylation patterns that include 513 CPG sites that are associated with age-related phenotypes. This test has been shown to be a better predictive, uh, predictor of mortality and morbidity than chronological age or first-generation epigenetic tests. Grim age was developed by Steve Horbath and his team at UCLA. It is based on DNA methylation patterns that include 1,035 CPG sites that are associated with mortality risk. The Grim age test also includes additional biomarkers such as smoking status, lung function, and serum levels of proteins associated with aging. The Grim age test has been shown to be a better predictive of mortality risk than other epigenetic tests with up to 96% accuracy. One of the most advanced clocks available today is called Dunedin Pace Clock. What is Dunedin Pace Clock? It stands for Pace of Aging Calculated from the Epigenome. To create this clock, the researchers used data from the Dunedin study, 1972-1973 birth cohort. Dunedin, by the way, is a town in New Zealand. 
and this is hard to read, so if you, it's really meant to show you all the different things that they did measure, but if you can't read it, that's okay. They tracked within individual decline against many indicators of organ system integrity and body functioning across four different time points, spanning two decades, to model pace of aging, or in other words, the ongoing rate of decline in system integ integrity. They distilled this into a single time point DNA methylation blood test, and they validated that clock against five additional databases. And the results of this endeavor have been impressive. First, Duden pace is distinct from DNA methylation clocks in both theory and method. It provides an estimate of pace of aging, which again is the ongoing rate of decline in system integrity. It shows high test, test retest reliability. It is uh, precise and has stronger associations with signs of aging. For instance, it is strongly associated with morbidity, disease, and mortality. It shows, uh, showed faster aging in older people, which we know to be true. Older people age faster than younger people. And this test, this test detected that. And it showed faster aging in young adults with childhood adversity, showing the negative impact that stress has on accelerating the aging process. So I'd like to walk through a concept here. Epigenetic age is theoretically measuring the accumulated damage of aging. Let's look at a fictitious example of a man named Peter. Peter is a 54-year-old man living in Southern California. In his 20s and 30s, he maintained an unhealthy lifestyle. He did shift work, he smoked a pack of cigarettes a day, he didn't eat well, and he didn't exercise. And that pattern of living caused him to age faster in this time window. But in his mid-40s, Peter started to take better care of himself. And because of this, his pace of aging slowed. Now, if Peter got an epigenetic test, it might tell him that he's two years older than his chronological age of 54. And this is due to how he lived when he was younger. But if he got a pace of aging test, it might tell him that he is currently aging only 10 months out of every, in every year. You could see his current pace of aging is slower, even though his biological, biological age calculation is older. If he just got an epigenetic age test, that might take the wind out of his sails. He might think that the things he are do, uh, that he's doing to be healthy aren't worth it, when actually the things that he is doing is worth it. So Duden and Pace is a good test, but researcher, researchers believe that there's still room for improvement in the accuracy of epigenetic clocks based on patterns of DNA methylation. At this time, there is no specific date for the launch of fourth generation epigenetic clocks, but researchers in this area, but research in this area is ongoing and constantly evolving. It's a very fast paced uh, field. And it is likely that we will continue to see developments in this field for the coming years. So this is an exciting area and it feels like we're making rapid progress here, but at the same time, there are many issues uh, that are in this, this space. While there are many years, um, while many of these tests are currently being commercialized, many researchers believe that this field is not ready for that, that these tests are better research tools uh, for studies, but not yet ready for individual meaning. Let's look at some of the concerns. Epigenetic age does not equal biological age. Technically, no measure will ever equal biological age. It is an, it's an impossibility. Biological age is, as Professor Morgan Levine calls it, a latent concept. And a latent concept is not directly observable, but is inferred or estimated from other variables that are observed or directly measured. And epigenetic clocks are measured only, only they're only measuring one phenotype of aging. So keep that in mind. These clocks are not interchangeable with biological age. We don't yet understand how specific epigenetic marks connect to the underlying processes of aging. They do not capture all the dimensionality of real biological aging. For instance, epigenetic clocks do not capture senescence, which has been shown to be an uh, important factor in the aging process. Therefore, epigenetic clocks are incomplete. And a given measure of, uh, of aging may or may not be less sensitive or overly sensitive to the results of a therapy that only addresses one mechanism of aging. So you can see how that could be misleading, and you're not sure what the results mean. We also know that aging rate is tissue specific. 
So attaining one score for a whole organism has challenges. If you average all tissues uh, for a score, some tissues will uh, have aged more than others. This is why not all, all people who have heart disease also have diabetes or cancer. If there was a single rate of aging, you would expect equal risk for all of these age-related diseases in an individual. So we, may, um, so we may need to split these clocks apart, identifying age and aging rates per tissue type. And that weakens, but doesn't eliminate the value of an, a universal health score. Currently, we have no idea if changes to epigenetic age through some intervention will equate to changes in risk. And we know that these tests may be too sensitive to uh, current inflammation status. For instance, I got a glycan age, biological age test, and it said I was 70 years old. And uh, at that time, I had it done, I was about 48 years old. Turns out I had COVID when I took the test, so I had high circulating inflammatory markers, and that skewed my biological age, according to their, their results. So keep that in mind. Lots of things can transiently increase inflammation, including exercise. But chronological age is regularly used in clinical decisions. And it's a valid endeavor to see if we can improve upon that when dealing with, spe with a specific individual. So here, the measurements of biological age, uh, you can never be exact, but over time with great refinement to our methods, including the use of artificial intelligence, we may likely get closer and closer to a true biological age. It's likely, however, that to do so, we will have to use multiple measures, not just one single one. So multiple clock tests, functional tests, structural tests, imaging, et cetera. Now remember, when we are measuring health, we're often measuring it, we're not often measuring it directly, but rather we are predicting it. Therefore, a good measurement of health is one that has good predictive value for future outcomes. In that regard, we don't need to limit our investigation to objective physiological measures. Rather, we can look at other factors that relate to more comprehensive assessments of health and also determine good, um, a good measurement for health. After all, humans are complex biological systems. Therefore, human health is best understood as arcs or trajectories instead of a static state. A health measurement indicating low health today might not yield the outcome that a static measurement would predict. Humans can change the circumstances in which we live, just like our friend Peter did, altering the trajectory towards various outcomes. And sure, one way to do that is to have good information on your state today. But that's not the only way to affect your future. This is why in my last talk, I introduced the concept of a health performance expert or HPE. This role would be like a primary care doctor, an expert generalist, but on the health training side of health. And this role would help train individuals across the lifespan on how to live healthier. So if you'd like, more thorough description of that idea that I'm advancing, please see my talk from a few months back at IHMC in Pensacola. But here, this image depicts a more complete healthcare network. Now, I do believe that these te tests of biological age can usher in a new era, not only to get you to do things we believe and understand to be healthy today, but to better refine what is actually working in a person and find novel ways to help us age better. This can be in the form of lifestyle strategies or possibly in the form of interventional compounds and multidimensional therapeutic systems. There is interest to see what actually does and doesn't work to affect the aging of our physiological systems, at least from the vantage of different tests and what they can and cannot measure. There is value here with these new tests, but I'd like to stress that for many of us, we if we employ health training based on the information that we do have today, we don't need to wait for what's coming in the future. There's lots of good information on how to be healthy now. So let's pan out and synthesize our thoughts here. We can categorize measurement into narrow and broad focuses. A narrow focus is using a biomarker or a diagnostic in this case to detect the presence of an illness or a disease. 
More broadly, we can also try to assess well-being. We can inquire about a person's life purpose, their happiness and joy, their self-actualization. We can look and see if they have resilient mind frames. For welfare, we can evaluate local environmental toxicity, healthy food access, personal and community safety, economic stability, sick care or health care. I like to call our healthcare system sick care because that's mostly what it's focused on, and education. And also in this list is wellness. Now this list I have is actually much longer, but these are the amount that fit on this page. Health literacy, skills training, mindset training, identity development, motivational refinement, local environment design, health tracking and monitoring. We can assess how a person engages with each one of these ideas. So the best picture of health should always aim to be more complete, as complete as possible. So in conclusion, I'd like to, I'd like to talk about a couple of ideas. First, with this quote from Peter Drucker, management consultant, winner of the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2002. What gets measured gets managed. This idea signifies that if you measure something, you are more likely to attend to it um, and to try to maintain a positive score. This can be a good thing, but it can also serve as a warning. What aren't we focusing on? And not everything that can be measured matters, but also not everything that matters can be measured. And lastly, I'd like to quote Goodhart's Law. Charles Goodhart is named after a British economist. This, this is named after British economist Charles Goodhart, who is credited with expressing the core idea of the adage in 1975 article on monetary policy in the United Kingdom. The idea is that whenever a measure becomes a target, it loses its value as a measure. The way to counteract this is to use multiple measures to evaluate a big complex issue. That way it's harder to game the system. So our future of measurement, uh, measuring health is not likely to come from one measure, but from the intelligent integration of multiple measures to yield a multidimensional understanding of your health in that moment. So that based on a solid understanding of your health situation now, you can make intelligent strides to optimize your own personal path forward. And with that, I'd like to thank the IHMC for having me back to speak. And I'd like to thank all of you here for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. So we'll take hands. Any hand up? Oh, Jonathan? Hi, uh, Dr. Jonathan Edwards. I guess I'd be considered one of those uh, longevity health experts. Great. It's uh, part of my practice. I'm a medical doctor. Two things, one uh, comment and then one Deep question. Yeah. Throughout my years as a cardiac anesthesiologist, I've seen so many people on the brink of death who looked young. So using the skin as an organ as a biomarker of, you know, health or biological age, I think is missing the point. Sure, it's part of it, but it's uncanny how many people look 20 to 30 years younger, but their hearts are ready to die. So that's that. Number two, this is obviously your wheelhouse. Given what do you think about evolutionary biologists like Yuval Harari, for example, who suggests that we should just give in, put chips in ourselves, give it to the health industries and government or whatever for the forwarding of mankind, since we do it with shopping, location, purchases, everything else in our life, this is the next step. Where do you stand on that? Thank you. So the, the first comment was, um, as somebody who has seen many people who look younger on the, on the outside but are ready to have a heart attack today, that illustrates my conclusion, which is that it's really important to look at multiple measures. So if you look at Goodhart's law, it's easy to get, that's actually a perfect example. So if in that example, that whenever a measure becomes a target, it loses its value as a measure. We can manipulate our skin 
and our external appearance, and that would actually make it seem like we're doing great, but on the inside, we might not be. That's why you would also want to do blood work and take, you know, look at your lifestyle, all those things that matter. So I totally agree with that. We can't just look at one thing. And oftentimes, the, too often now, even the work in biological age, they're trying to find one measure. And what we're finding is that the better the me these measures get, part of it is in the DNA methylation patterns, but part of it is when they include mo other types of tests like do the, does the person smoke and other biomarkers. So I think that's always gonna be the case and that's why I concluded with, with what I did. I, don't, I think it's probably uh, a red herring to try to find that one marker. I hope, people, I hope scientists continue to try. I hope they continue to try. But it's unlikely, in my perspective now, that that's going to be the result. Rather, we're gonna have to do a more comprehensive scan. Now, the second question was around this idea that uh, Yuval Harari says, you know, why don't we just chip, uh, that was my perspective on this, should everybody be chipped so that we can track information and then hopefully that would create so much data that we would have deeper understanding into things that could make people healthier. Is that a fair representation of your question? Okay, good. I think this is, you know, do I think we should do that? Uh, I think people can make a decision for them. Everybody cares who's a cell phone. So much data is being captured there that I don't think that we need to chip ourselves by, by going under our skin. We have it in our pocket. I'm like, I, don't, I feel naked not having my phone in my pocket right now because it's in my bag. Um, and yeah, there, there might come a time when we can have an implantable device that could collect. In fact, there was a company that was invested by, in, in by some members uh, some VCs that invested in Fitbit called Sano Health, and they were looking at 50 different analytes with a patch that went onto your skin and would measure them for two weeks. And I, I was excited about what that could yield, but it never came to fruition. That was probably 10 or 15 years ago, and there hasn't been any product that's been commercialized at that time. Maybe something like that will happen in the future. Um, but we are, we're collecting data in all sorts of ways. Like in my conversation with Pankaj Kapahi, to do a fundus scan, typically only a ophthalmologist can do that because you need a special camera. But there might be a bunch of different opportunities with the things that we usually do where we can collect some more data on ourselves and then that can actually create a more comprehensive picture of your health. That's pretty cool. And of course, I think people should have the ability to opt into that if they want to. And typically with documents that say, would you like to participate in this or would you like to give your health data in this way? You're given the right to choose where your health data goes. So yeah, I think that, you know, that's, that's sort of my answer to that, is that it, it's happening around us. I don't know if it'll ever necessarily be implantable, but I could be wrong. It actually probably will. It probably will be implantable at some point. Any other questions at this moment? Okay. I might wanna come a little forward. Okay. okay. I'm ignorant. Bear with me. I'm on a statin. I hate that thought. And it's, I'm sorry. I'm on a statin. Yeah. I hate that. Hmm. Okay. And it's based on obviously monitoring my blood over the last several years. But it's done twice a year. Wouldn't a better measure, I mean, would, for, for reliability and yeah. validation, yeah. somebody should be doing my blood work every day at the same time and looking at a better picture. But if I don't take the statin, well then, you know, my healthcare provider will probably ditch me. So how are we supposed to make good decisions when what I know about statistics and health and wellness and general welfare, how are consumers supposed to make these decisions? Do I just ditch the statin and pray or take the statin and pray some more? So that's, does that make any sense? Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if we could collect that type of data on ourselves more frequently so that if you happen to have a number that is out of a range that leads to a clinical decision, that then means you have to be on a medication for the rest of your life. 
Wouldn't it be nice if we had a period of time where we measured that marker over time? And aside from whether or not you're put on a drug, wouldn't it be nice to then actually have some form of lifestyle training to say, let's see if we can solve this issue, not with a medication, but through your lifestyle. And I am not anti-medication. What I'm anti is trying to solve our problems with that way first. Medications have their place, but what is, and the reason why, it's not due to some perspective that the li lifestyle is, you know, is the only way to go. There are times we need medications and they can do what lifestyle cannot. But typically when we institute a lifestyle change that has a meaningful effect on that type of a marker, it has pleiotropic effects. It might affect other systems in your body in a positive way as well. Isn't that worth the chance to see if we can get a person to adopt that type of lifestyle training for a period? And then you might kick the, you know, it might be five years before you have to go on a statin or whatever that is, but wouldn't that be ideal? I absolutely agree. I think that is the case at least four times a year with blood work, I think. And that's, that's uh, at least. There are companies, one is called, if I remember correctly, Core Therapeutics. They've been quiet for a while, but you do a finger prick every day, they measure your blood, and, they're, and this is at home. And in fact, it was one of the found, uh, the main person, I forget his name, was the person who developed the light signaling on the back of the Apple Watch. So it can look into the skin and it can detect different, different things, lots of different things. They're using that type of technology to try to then assess the, the shape of different proteins and then say, well, this is your level of LDL. I don't exactly know what they can predict, but because the, the idea is out there, but I haven't seen the details. But that could be coming as well and that could give us a more rapid, well, first of all, if there is a situation, we might not wait till the, let's, you know, one year before you see your doctor again. You might be able to act on it sooner. And secondarily, you might see that that fluctuation was just because of the natural fluctuation and actually you don't have a problem. So yeah, I think technology can help solve a lot of these problems. So hopefully we'll see more of that in the future. But I'm, I like information. I'd rather have more, but sometimes information can be problematic too. So yeah, thank you for the question. Okay, I'll take one more question. What we've got, okay, two if they're fast, okay? Can you catch? Thank you. As you pointed out, our current uh, medical system is designed to diagnose and treat illness. Is there any kind of uh, significant movement within the medical community uh, to promote wellness instead of just treating sickness and disease? You have to watch my last talk. <laughs> so what does the medical system currently call their wellness efforts typically? Prevention, preventative medicine. Is the only way to live your life a certain way to prevent a disease? I'll give you an example. The best diabetes prevention program needn't mention the word diabetes once as long as it gets people to live in a particular way that happens to prevent diabetes. There are so many ways that we can affect a person's desire to live in a healthy manner. And it doesn't have to be all oriented around a disease, particularly the farther you are from a diagnosis of a disease, the less power a disease modification has. The closer you get to it, then you start to pay more attention with the specter of fear around it. We wanna to start to act way before, way in advance. That's why with this position, that I have came up with, the health performance expert, we would start to train young people how to live successfully, healthfully, right from when in schools. Then we would have support for families. We would have every, every large company would have a chief health officer, which probably would not be populated by a medical doctor. I'm not anti-medical doctor, but they are not wellness experts. And so I do like the fact when a doctor has a wellness orientation, they care about your diet, they ask about it, but you're not going to do well, even if you could see your doctor four times a year and they spent a half an hour talking to you about health and wellness in those times, that is an unrealistic scenario for most people. It would break our healthcare system and most people don't get that and it wouldn't be enough. What if you could only go to your soccer coach four times a year for a half an hour to get better at soccer? 
Because when we're talking about wellness, we're talking about developing skills in an individual. When you're going to the medical system, you want to find somebody that has a tremendous amount of knowledge, listen to what they say, and follow their plan. With wellness, it's about embedding knowledge into yourself so that you can live differently and with a knowledgeable perspective on how to do that. That's a totally different paradigm. And that's why I think there needs to be interaction, right? They have to speak the same language, right? There has to be har harmony between our sick care system and our self-care system. But we will never achieve the results that we want if we try to subjugate wellness under the medical system. It is oriented towards doing a different thing. That thing is very important. And we need something to, we, we have a whole different branch that can do something different. Okay, we're gonna take this one last question. Here you go, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Um, one of the problems with health measurements is that you can't take an advance of what an event may happen to people. And I know we've all known people of real healthy and then they have an injury or an illness. And no matter how you measure it, you can't take into account the, what may unexpectedly happen. Uh, yeah. More of a comment than a question, but I think you kind of answered that too. Yeah. Yeah, I think more, more frequent measurement could occur. Some of the biomarkers are looking at that I talked about with, let's say, heart disease, which is the number one killer. They look at cardiac enzymes. You know, is, there, is there signs of damage early on? Uh, there's some now, um, some interesting proteomics tests. So I think we'll still maintain the cheaper screening, but hopefully we can do that more frequently before we do the more invasive, more time-intensive, more costly tests. I'm okay with that, that strategy. But I think with artificial intelligence, we're gonna be able to make more out of the data we have. So there's a confluence of technology factors that I think could usher us into a new era where we actually can take better care of ourselves and have real prevention uh, for unnecessary illness and mortality. So thank you for your question. Okay, everyone, thank you for being here. Thank you, Dan.